Well, if you follow the geopolitical change, and you shouldn't be surprised regarding the concept called political polarization. Uh, looking around the world today, that more countries are undergoing this political transformation. Now, needless to say, that when we talk about this political agenda, and the first thing that come to our mind is about the word economy, and of course, that the economic agenda, or should we say, this economic projection matters to all of us, especially this post-pandemic period. But meanwhile, how much do you understand this correlation between the political polarization and also the human relationships? That too often, when we get to the conversation today, regardless, we have the conversation with our friends, or within the families, or maybe just out in the public. People tend to discover that if you belong to one certain political parties or believe that certain political ideology, that we consider them as outsiders. And also, what's threatening today that within the relationship under the same roof, for example, you know, the siblings and also this marriage, most people today are very concerned regarding how political or how politics are actually influencing the modern-day marriage. As a matter of fact, younger generations today are slowly and quietly walking away from this committed relationship, and part of the reason has something to do with the modern-day political atmosphere. How should we understand the reason behind that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, who is Professor Brett Wilcox.、Uh, professor Wilcox is a professor of sociology, and also he's the director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia. And mainly, he came out with this new book, which is called "Get Married: Why Americans Should Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization." Well, Brett. And welcome to the missing piece. Great to be here with you today, Will. Well, Brad, it's such an interesting phenomenon today that, as I mentioned in the intro, we're seeing this political polarization around the world, and particularly in the U.S. Why do you think it's so critical for us to understand that we are seeing this population decline, and we're seeing this marriage commitment decline, and has something to do with the current? Political atmosphere. What is the complication behind this analysis? Your thoughts. So, well, what we know from the work of Joseph Heinrich at Harvard is that in most, you know, civilizations across time and space, you know, from China to the West,、mm. marriage has been, in his words, the keystone institution. You know, it tends to orient adult sexual romantic relationships. It tends to kind of domesticate men. It tends to bridge the divide between the sexes, and most importantly, it tends to give kids. A stable family context where they have the attention and the affection and the resources of both parents being directed towards them.、Mm. So marriage is key, and the challenge today is that there are a lot of forces driving young women and young men apart and making it more difficult for them to put a ring on it to get married.、Mm. And one of those factors, as your introduction, I think, was you know indicating. That is driving young women and young men apart today is the shifting ideological currents of our cultural context.、Mm. You know, and about thirty, forty, fifty years ago, there weren't, you know, major divides ideologically between women and men. In some ways, you know, if you look, if you can look in the U.S. at least in certain points in history, and see at certain points that women were more conservative than men were.、Mm. Um, but that is not this moment. What we're seeing is that you know, in recent years,、um, young men have been moving pretty hard to the left. Um, sort of doubling their identification with being、um, liberal or progressive、mm. in recent decades, and at the same time, young men have been primarily kind of staying in one place, but maybe a little bit to the right. And the consequence, though, is that there are kind of in the ideological extremes you know, about two liberal women for every liberal guy, and a, you know about two conservative guys for every conservative woman. So. Um, and it kind of depends on what data set you would look at, but the, the 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 broader point here is that ideological fissures have emerged, divisions have emerged among young adults today in the United States and other countries, including, of course, South Korea.、Um, and these ideological divisions are just one other factor that are making it harder for young adults to kind of come together to date, to mate, to marry,、uh, and then form families together.、Mm. Well, Brett. Again, as we're looking at this relationship complication, and there's no surprise 
that today we're seeing more dating websites and more dating apps. And again, I have to say a lot more people around me who are very active and using the dating apps and the websites. But meanwhile, according to a recent article that you co-authored and based on the survey, and I quote, about two thirds of liberal and the conservative singles would be more likely to quote, swipe left and reject a potential match who did not share their politics. I mean, we know that, let's just say, again, going back to the uh, example around me, I have friends that who are married and happily married, and the husband and wife, they do not share the same political ideology. But meanwhile, that does not create the reason not for them to be together. As a matter of fact, they're wonderfully and happily married, and they have children. But we're looking at the younger generations are very much different. So again, going back to the question, how important and significant for the younger generations today to really, it's not even about the word married, it's about the word to stay committed or even to say, build this relationship with like-minded people. Why is that important? Is it because we're seeing this political uncertainty or they seeing this political division within our country or even something bigger than that? What do you say to that? I think there are a couple of factors that are kind of, you know, shaping the current cultural context in ways that are that are different than was the case, you know, for a generation or generation to ago. And I certainly know plenty of couples who are happily married who are on, you know, different partisan teams. Mm. Um, but I think the challenge today is that there's a certain kind of um, emotional attachment mm. that people have, you know, um, kind of connected to one party or, or the other or towards one ideological side or the other. And they now think of the other side, you know, um, and we've seen this in, in polling data as not just maybe, you know, wrong headed, mm. but as evil, you know. And so if you think that Donald Trump is the devil incarnate, um, if you think that, you know, Joe Biden is, you know, um, ideologically uh, corrupt or whatever, I mean, is, you know, just unacceptable. Um, then I think your willingness to sort of cross partisan or ideological lines is going to be to date someone is going to be um, pretty pretty uh, pretty low. And there are other things too. I think in terms of things that go into a strong marriage or things like common friends. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that couples who have shared friends are more likely to be happily married, more likely to be even sexually faithful if they have overlapping mm -hmm. friends. It kind of it, it creates a certain degree of accountability um, within that within the relationship. Um, and then it's also the case too, that I think when it comes to kind of thinking about the division of housework and childcare and how, how you're gonna kind of arrange your life together as a couple, um, that's often connected to ideology. And so if you don't have some common way of thinking about, you know, organizing your family life and a common friendship group, that's gonna kind of be with you and for you. It's gonna be harder to, you know, to have a successful marriage. So that's the challenge, I think. So, for, and there, but also we have to be honest here. There are plenty of folks who are in the middle, right? Maybe center right, center left, not too partisan, not too, you know, connected to the <laughs> to the news cycle. And those couples, you know, you can have a center right guy and a center left, you know, gal who, who do just fine, right? Today, um, but I think people who are kind of more serious partisans who are more serious ideological, you know devotees will have a great deal of difficulty uh, today um, dating and, and, and marrying. Mm. Brett, I know in your book that you touch on this topic, I mean, in a very extensive way, which, again, I have to say that I thoroughly enjoy reading your book. Let's talk about the perspective of religion. I mean, again, we know that when it comes to marriage or when it comes to this commitment, a lot of younger generations today, in addition to the political interest, and also they're very much interested in this religion commonality, or we call it religious commitment. So throughout your study and also uh, uh, the content that you mentioned in the book, how critical it is for the younger generations today to understand that I, I would love to be married, you know, I love to stay committed in the relationship, you know, we can have different political interests and we have different uh, political background. But when it, con when it comes to religious commitment or when it comes to religious uh, uh, commonality, I mean, it, is that something still 
important and critical for the younger generations. I mean, again, we're looking at the spectrum that someone say who's an atheist, you know, or let's say someone who doesn't really believe in Christianity or in this permagnetism, uh, uh, this uh, sense of evangelicalism. So, how do you think that this religion play in the modern day marriage or even this modern day relationship? What do you say to that? So it's interesting. There was a piece in the New Yorker not too long ago where a prominent American sociologist named Sam Perry was interviewed. He was kind of painting a very negative portrait, well, of kind of the link between family and faith in America, mm. mentioning that you know for Christian uh, evangelical men and women, uh, there is kind of like this idea that sex is sacred, mm. and that makes pornography use, you know, a much more salient issue for them, you know, making men guilty and, and wives unhappy if they have that, you know, some kind of issue around this, this issue of pornography, which of course is a more contemporary concern. And, and you kind of, you had kind of this idea coming away from the New Yorker interview with Sam Perry that Christianity was kind of like this throwback, this antiquarian thing that kind of left couples with hangups that mm. made their, their marriage just more difficult. Now, to be fair, it is true that for Christians, and I think any religious couple, you know, uh, basically, if there is an issue with, you know, pornography, that is a more salient concern for those kinds of people and couples across the board. But what this article did not do well was kind of give the broader portrait, well, mm. um, of kind of the average story for faith and family in America. And in my book, I basically explain that, you know, on average, um, religious couples, evangelical Christians, Catholics, Jews, you know, uh, whatever, um, are more likely to be flourishing. They're about 15 percentage points more likely to be very happy with mm -hmm. their marriages. Depending upon the data set, they're between 30 and 45 percent less likely to get divorced mm -hmm. compared to their peers who are not religious. And what we are seeing now, and I think this is just fascinating, especially given the New Yorker, New Yorker's focus on, on religion and sex, is we're actually seeing that today, well, there's about a 20 percentage point gap in terms of at least weekly sex between frequent churchgoers and folks who don't go to church at all in mm. favor of frequent churchgoers. Mm. So in 2000, there was no gap between religion and sexual frequency in marriage in America. Today, there is a large gap and religious couples are much more likely to be having sex than their secular peers. Mm. And they're also markedly happier in their marriages when it comes to their sexual satisfaction. Mm. So what I'm saying to you is that, you know, a lot of, I think, the media depictions, even social media, you know, kind of understandings of religion and family, religion and marriage, which tend to often paint a kind of negative portrait, you know, kind of want to sort of say religion's out of touch. It's just, you know, um, it doesn't kind of fit with the 21st century. <clears throat> don't actually tell the truth. And I think when it comes to faith, because religion tends to connect people to other couples who are trying to be good husbands, good wives, good fathers, good mothers, um, gives them social support, gives them social control too, keeps them from, you know, drinking to excess, using drugs, being, you know, unfaithful, um, all those things, and then endows their lives, what kind of call it in sociology, like a basically a sacred canopy mm. over their lives. It kind of endows their lives a sense of meaning and purpose that helps them to navigate both the good times and the bad times. Um, what we see is that for ordinary couples in the United States, at least, um, there's a very strong connection between uh, faith and uh, flourishing marriages mm. and flourishing families. That's sort of the bottom line. Mm. Brett, I want to go back to the word marriage. I mean, again, this is the critical piece that in your book, again, the why Americans should define the elites and form the strong families. I have to say that when it comes to uh, come to the word marriage, that again, uh, when I was a student uh, in graduate school, that I would never forget the the lesson that I took when we talk about marriage and we tend to think about a good, I mean, again, a fam one of the famous couples in American history, the Kennedy family. I mean, again, we call the Camelot, right? And we'll look at the good-looking John of Kennedy and also, of course, this beautiful first lady, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy. But fast forward today, I think for all of us, and also the, particularly the younger generations, 
we are interpreting the word marriage in a more what we call multicultural or even more complex concept. It's not just about the word being faithful. It's not just about the word being committed. It's more about equality. It's more about sharing, understanding responsibilities. So going back to your book, part of the title of the book is why Americans should define the elites. So help us with better understanding what happened to the concept of marriage transition from the Camelot to what is happening today, putting religion, putting politics on the side. How do you think people are viewing the commitment of the marriage today? How important it is to have the word equality, to have the word sharing responsibilities, and also a, a more concept along with that. What do you say to that, Brad? Yeah, so well, I think there has been a dramatic shift from you know the 60s when you had the Kennedys and others kind of, you know, with a much more clearly defined division of labor where the husband mm. was kind of focusing on work outside the home and wife is focusing on, you know, the care of the, the children and kind of managing the household from the domestic side, the private side of, of the family. So I think today we see a lot of couples across the ideological spectrum, conservative, liberal, whatever, um, who are sharing the work of the home and the family in a much more powerful um, and generally helpful way. Um, so I think equality is, has really kind of um, shaped by a lot of contemporary couples are thinking about the work of, of marriage, um, the work of caring for kids and running a household. But I think the challenge is in this newer context is a lot of men are floundering mm. and a lot of women are unhappy with the quality of the men that they find when it comes to dating um, and even when they're married to them. And I think part of the challenge here is we have to understand that equality doesn't necessarily have to mean a 50-50 division of labor. Mm. You know, I think having some recognition that women and men are different in some important ways and that they can kind of develop in their own marriage, a kind of division of labor where, you know, certain tasks are done by him and certain ones are done by her and that they're roughly, you know, equal, but just, you know, kind of aiming for equality in terms of sameness, I think for most couples ends up being a dead end. And by contrast, aiming for a reality where there's a recognition that you have different interests and talents on average, and you can kind of work with those talents to figure out how best to arrange your your family um, work probably to find is, is, is the path. Now, I think the challenge is for men is I think there's the temptation for us men to kind of like just focus on primarily on our work and, you know, making a good living and then not to appreciate how much our investments emotionally and practically in our marriage and in our kids are valued and needed. And what we do see in my book is that the most kind of important issue when it comes to dividing up the labor or the work of the home is really the care of kids when you have kids in the household. Um, mm -hmm. And so for both liberal and conservative women, they're markedly happier when their husbands are, you know, really engaged with the kids, you know, taking on a serious role and um, spending time with the kids, teaching the kids, coaching the kids, you know, just doing kid things one way or another. And then of course, also too, there's a real kind of emotional engagement. And one woman that I spoke to, for instance, who was a you know successful young attorney, was saying to me, like, it's really important for me to have my husband be with me and the phone is down. Mm. So the phone's down and it's eye to eye, mm. you know. And so we have time in the day. She's talking about her, you know, her relationship, time of the day where they're just kind of talking, you know, um, sharing what's going on in their lives, and they're not distracted by technology. So I think. That emotional engagement on his part and then especially kind of his engagement with the kids um, are two crucial ingredients, regardless of ideology. Um, and they would distinguish, I think, today's couples from the way a lot of our grandparents or great grandparents would have you know, organized their own family lives. Brad, I want to ask you two more questions before letting you go. Now, let's talk about the word marriage put in a very simple way how important it is today, particularly today, we're looking at this complexity of the geopolitical change and also this intricacy of the economic agenda. Of course, everyone is very concerned about the future for the world. But again, as I mentioned in the intro, we're seeing more countries today are facing this population decline. 
But meanwhile, again, government officials and leaders are very concerned about the younger generations. You know, again, fewer babies, which means the aging population is growing, and this is just causing imbalance. But coming back to the question, I would like to ask. How critical and important it is for people to stay married, or perhaps not even just married, to be in a relationship. I mean, I understand everyone is very different. Friends around me, some prefer being single for a while, and some prefer seeking healthful and positive relationship. But again, as I was reading your book, the question still dances in my mind: is why stay single? I mean, you have the quality, you have the good characteristics. Let's be in a relationship, or let's stay, uh, uh, let's get married. So, can you help us with better understanding the importance and the significance of being in a relationship, or eventually lead to a health, a healthful and positive, happy marriage? Great questions, Will. I think the, the the first point that I make is civilizational. Part of my subtitle is about saving civilization.、Mm. I mentioned at the beginning, Joe Heinrich's work. He's a he's a prominent. Anthropologist at Harvard talking about marriage as a keystone for civilization, for most civilizations across time and space, including I would say in China and the United States. And I think the point there is that、um, we are social animals, as Aristotle said. And if we have a foundational institution that is marriage, it kind of organizes our most important relationship in a positive and constructive way. On average, in general. Our civilization is more likely to be thriving.、Mm. What we see in the United States, at least, is that when it comes to falling happiness, when it comes to rising deaths of despair, and when it comes to kind of the health of the American dream, this is this idea that poor kids can rise to affluence and adulthood, but rags to riches. You know, classic American story. That's the American dream.、Mm. On those three outcomes, we're often seeing that marriage or family structure is the number one factor, or close to the top factor. So Raj Chetty's work at Harvard. Tells us, for instance, that the share of two-parent families in communities across America is the number one predictor of mobility for poor kids. Okay, that's the American dream.、Mm. Are we seeing a new study from the University of Chicago telling us that the top factor, number one factor, that explains why happiness in America is coming down is that fewer Americans are married.、Mm. So that's the kind of civilizational point that when marriage is doing. You know, well, then economically, emotionally, people are more likely to be thriving across the society. When marriage is floundering, then happiness is down, and the mobility of poor kids is going to be more in.、Um, you know,、uh, they're going to be more immobile, more stuck in place, stuck, stuck in poverty.、Um, so that's the kind of the big piece. But then to answer, I think the question for ordinary people is, what does this mean for me personally? I think the point I would make is that. Again, Aristotle said that we're social animals, and a lot of young adults today think that、um, education,、uh, work, building their own brand, being free, having lots of fun—that this is sort of the path to building a meaningful and fulfilling and happy life. And I would say, no. You know, we know from a lot of different sources、mm. in religious traditions, in philosophy, that in fact, being part and parcel of a community. Um, having real deep relationships and having opportunities both to receive care and even more importantly to give care towards others、mm. is where most of us find meaning and happiness. And so I think、uh, the point about marriage is that there's no other institution that gives us so many opportunities to have a sense of meaning and purpose about our lives, especially with our kids,、um, and then also to give、um, and receive care, you know, from others and and, and to others. And now I think the big challenge here, though, is that in both historically and then also in some ways in the East Asian context, there is a sense that men have not been kind of doing their share on a variety of levels. And so I think going forward, the challenge is how do we get men, especially, to recognize that they've got to be more intentional about caring for their girlfriend, wife,、uh, and kids than. Was kind of the historical norm. This is kind of the path towards reviving the fortunes of marriage for the 21st century,、um, and that's incredibly important for them, for、um, the women in their lives, and for the future of their civilizations as well. Well, well said, Brett. I mean, that reminds me one of the sayings or one of the quotes that I heard before. It goes as the quality of our lives. It's based on the quality of our relationships with one another, and I think this is really critical for us to keep in mind. 
Now, I want to wrap up our conversation by asking you the last question. Again, your book is called "Get Married: Why Americans Should Define the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization." So, what would you expect the readers to understand and appreciate when the person finishes reading the last chapter of this book? I mean, again, as we mentioned before. Getting married, it's very easy, but stay committed, it's rather difficult. But again, we're seeing the population decline. We're seeing younger generations today are shifting their attitude towards the conventional and traditional family settings. So, what are your hopes for the readers to appreciate from your book? Your final thoughts. So, what we're seeing oftentimes on the internet and the media is this idea that you know from the left is that. Uh, marriage is a pathway to immiseration and misery. There was a story in Bloomberg that said that women who stay single are getting richer, <laughs> um, kind of targeting women on the left. And then、mm. there's been a lot of commentators on the right, you know, people like Andrew Tate, who say that there's zero statistical advantage to men from getting married. So from both the left and the right, you know, targeting women from the left, men from the right, we're getting, getting this message that. If you want to be kind of prosperous, if you want to be happy, steer clear of marriage, steer clear of the encumbrances of family.、Mm. What we see in the real world, though, actually,、um, is that in terms of the data, you know, in my book, is that for most most adults, the path to prosperity and happiness runs to marriage、mm. um, and not away from it. And the final thing that I would say is that there's also, I think, a lot of concern about divorce in the culture today. And my book talks about five pillars to avoid divorce, and those pillars are、um, fostering communion in marriage, like date night, recognizing the second C is children, recognizing that marriage matters for、uh, your kids if you have them. The third C is commitment, recognizing that marriages are stronger when you embrace fidelity and、mm. marital permanence. The fourth C is about cash. Understanding the importance of a regular income stream, especially from the husband in the marriage, and the fifth C is about community, recognizing that marriages are stronger and people have us, you know, a community that surrounds them and supports them、um, in this、uh, in this adventure of marriage and family. Hmm. Well, again, those are very helpful tips. Again, as we're looking at the、uh, different generations and we're looking at how the societies are changing today. But again, I have to say that after reading your book, or as I was reading your book, and the more I read, and it's very enlightening, and、um, it's of course as we talk about the word marriage, it's not just about the relationship; it's about the faithfulness and the commitment, and also we're looking, you know, look at how the two partners in this relationship are really dedicating themselves. For the bigger picture, well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to Brett Wilcox again. Professor Wilcox is a professor of sociology, and also he is the director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia. And I strongly encourage everyone go online to really check out his, this amazing book, which is entitled "Get Married: Why Americans Should Define the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization." Well, Professor Wilcox, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure, and we'd love to have you back on the show as we continue the relevant topics around families, around fatherhood, and most importantly about the human relationships. So, thank you so much for doing this.